Several years ago, after a career spent looking forward as a technologist and entrepreneur, I decided to take a step back from my technocentric world to gain a broader perspective through writing a book about innovation and personally learning more about myself and the unconscious forces that drive us, I realized the importance of embracing the concept of both, or all, the at times seemingly conflicting positive and negative aspects of life. So today, instead of talking about the next big thing, I want to provoke more thought about the implications of our current technologies and the need to balance our digital diets. As our world becomes more digital, we need to remember that humans aren't binary, one or zero, good or bad. We are complex, as is our relationship to the technologies that we create. Just as we can become entranced by a new person we meet, we can become blindsided by a new medication or gadget and then later see its other side, its flaws, its side effects, or unintended consequences. Only through actively recognizing the negatives can we then decide to accept, try to change, attempt to protect ourselves from, or simply not engage. But when it comes to technological change, I'm concerned that we're not adequately prepared to acknowledge or compensate for the downsides, either through a lack of understanding or simply following the path to least resistance. Many of the world's problems are caused by various forms of ideological extremism, a world where digital extremism has become all too common will not help but hinder our progress. And as each generation grows up exponentially more dependent upon and accepting new normative digital behaviors, it may become even harder to detect the consequences or affect change if we do. The evolution of the food industry is a story of multiple levels of unintended consequences from pesticides to factory farms to new food trends. It can serve as a good model and warning. The creation of high fructose corn syrup originated as a low-cost alternative sweetener, but is now commonly viewed by most as a major contributor to obesity and disease. Most would agree that eating real foods and not highly processed replacements, along with moderation and exercise, will lead to a healthier life. And long ago, we ate a simple diet because that was what was available. But innovation in food science and production coupled with new technologies such as the microwave oven, brought us cheaper and more convenient foods, many of which may be behaviorally or chemically addictive, as they are more processed and synthetically enhanced. Yes, our food is cheaper, but we are paying with our health, and it's hard to really know what we are consuming, even with advances in food labeling. Corporate interests are not always aligned with our well-being, and the food industry today, from production to retail, makes it easier and cheaper to consume a diet overly weighted in empty calories than one that will result in good health. I was fortunate to be part of the research group at Stanford when we sent the first bits of information across what would become the Internet. Its open and transparent architecture heralded in a new level of democratization, encouraged innovation, and gave individuals and organizations a voice regardless of their size or location. It brought people together. And the web was a provided a relief from the constant marketing of traditional media. At least, that was the idea. But we never imagined that the internet and the web would give birth to e-commerce and digital media, mobile communications and social networking, which combined have tremendous positive impacts on how we work and live. But unfortunately, as with the food industry, a trend of increased dependence and addiction, along with growing complexity, is underway with the digital services and products that we consume. And as with our food diets, there is not any one invention or behavior that is the problem. It is the interplay of many that lead to the precarious balance of our digital diets. And this comic illustrates it so well. We have created a monster, a landscape where too often money, not talent or quality, drive visibility and success. 
advertising-based services lower or eliminate costs to consumers. But with constant innovation in data science and targeted marketing, we are still paying, not with our wallets, but with data about our lives and a forced tolerance to a constant barrage of brand. The tech industry today is again dominated by a small number of corporate gatekeepers, as is true in other industries from food to pharma to retail. And as our addictions to and expectations of digital services grow, so does the requirement for bandwidth, processing power, or screen size. And that may be good for the industry and those who can afford it, but it does feed the digital divide, which in turn reinforces other interrelated inequalities such as income and education. Some of the consequences of our perverted food diets, such as obesity, are visible. Others, such as high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, are internal and may not show up for years. Well, the same is true of our digital diets. We are already seeing rehab for video game addiction, online bullying, not to mention cybercrime or the dark side of the web. The potential internal effects on our brains and psyches, including our capacity for deep thought, feeling, and personal connection, may be harder to detect. And then there are individual and societal changes that we may never understand. All of the information at our fingertips should enhance our ability to think and solve problems. But in a world of instantaneous communication and gratification, we too often look for quick fixes, hacks, taking a pill, lacking the patience to identify the root cause of or even tackle challenges for which we can't Google an answer. A recent headline that people would rather shock themselves than sit and think is certainly indicative of a sad trend. <laughs> Ingesting small snippets of information on our phones has become the norm to the extent that we may no longer have the patience for or attention span for anything more complex. We've gone from communicating through books and memos and letters to email and power pump bullets and now pictures and tweets. We are flooded with content. But with these new forms of communication that convey little or no context, how do we know that we're getting the meaning behind that message? And diversity of perspective is key to critical thought, but we're being exposed to less. Our search results and news feeds are filtered for us automatically based on our prior behaviors. And we too often self-filter by only accessing those sources that reinforce our point of view. In a world of speak or post first and check later, how do we know what is fact, hypothesis, opinion, gossip, or outright lie. If you hear something often enough, you may take it as fact or consensus, not realizing that it all started from one single source fanning out in minutes across social and traditional media. Do we run the risk of not just being uninformed, but misinformed? A real threat to our minds and a democracy that relies on an informed public. Moving beyond the impacts on how we think are the digital habits that are transforming who we are. Our digital services connect us with friends and family and community, but we inadvertently turn those tools against ourselves when we value quantity over quality, striving for number of friends and not depth of connection or number of views versus getting information to the right people. With our eyes glued to our phones, we're showing off our lives instead of experiencing them. Perhaps all of this activity gives us some sense of control in a world where we are actually too vulnerable to allow for emotion. As we expose more information about ourselves to others, what appears as openness may actually lead to more scripted, less authentic relationships as everybody focuses on furthering their own personal brands, reinforcing the me. I love it when my son sends me a picture giving me a glimpse into his busy day, but what does it say about our selfie obsession when spectators in the crowd, supposedly watching the Tour de France, 
had their backs to the race, at times putting cyclists at risk in the interest of getting a good shot. The resources of the web can help further our understanding of both human and mother nature, but not if we block out what is too troubling to see or worse, become desensitized through overexposure. Challenges such as climate change, healthcare, income inequality, require changes to consumer behavior that benefit society and not just the individual. With our current culture of me, do we have an environment in which that can even occur? As we lose the ephemeral nature of our conversations, it becomes harder to react and not overreact to the other, to take, retract something said in haste, or move beyond past mistakes. You are what you eat, and you may seemingly become what you tweet, but that may not be who you are. Terms like FOMO, fear of missing out, are now part of our vocabulary as we judge ourselves through the views of others, comparing our real lives to the illusions that people post, measuring our worth and success in number of likes, followers, and retweets. With many, this can drown out a sense of self and personal authority, both capacities at the core of leadership. And the use of the vast amount of data being collected and consolidated is not just intrusive, but invasive if organizations move beyond research and data mining for marketing purposes to active experimentation or making decisions to hire us or sell us insurance based on our information about our daily habits that they have purchased or learned from our unwitting exposure or our own oversharing. The many issues that I have raised are complex. There are no simple solutions. And our economic growth is so closely tied to technological innovation. So what can we possibly do to establish some new cultural norms to counteract some of these problems? Let me end by suggesting a few places that we might start. Transparency, education, mindfulness, and sustainability. We need transparency as to what actually happens when we are engaging with our digital services and better controls over our privacy. And whereas I'm not suggesting that we take the pharmaceutical approach to TV advertising, where they show seductive images suggesting a cure for anything that ails you, while they tell you all the ways it might kill you, <laughs> what is the equivalent of a food label for a web service or a mobile app? Certainly not today's terms of service. And we need to be better educated. Increasing resources are going into teaching more people how to code, and that is great, but not enough. We should be teaching technology literacy and behaviors, the equivalent of nutrition classes, sex education, or driver's ed, to ki all kids and adults, so that we can make informed choices. And we need to be mindful, be more aware of the good and negative impacts of the di these digital services on ourselves and on others, and slow down. Look up from our phones, not react immediately to every interruption and impulse. Maybe count to 10 before clicking agree. Even if it may never be proven that spending all of your time communicating online may be detrimental to your capacity for intimate connection, protecting against such possibility by a better balance of offline and online activity, more in-person contact, is good preventative health. Organizations also need to be more mindful, paying for better protecting our data, and paying more attention to what they really need to collect. Companies should be encouraged to look at alternative business models, less dependent on selling our information, and yes, that means that consumers need to not expect that everything always be free. And I would like to see even more entrepreneurs addressing actual human needs and not just the needs of marketeers. 
perhaps by starting by responding to some of these unintended consequences that we have created and not just continually reinforcing them. And last, we need to worry about sustainability of some key resources, our minds, the way we think, our sense of self, and our connection to others. For having lost control of our digital diets, we face potential psychological disorders every bit as destructive as the obesity epidemic. We must decipher how to get back to living our lives fully, achieving our goals by clicking and swiping less and thinking more.